other families. So they all drove down two hours from Grayling, Michigan to be at the Protect My Pet rally in Lansing. We didn't want his death to be in vain. So um, I've activated for several other families in Northern Michigan whose sadly pets have been killed by neighbors. Tuesday, dozens of other people joined them rallying and marching for the Protect My Pet ballot initiative. We see that abuse equals abuse. And if you're going to starve, beat, torture an animal to death, there's a good chance you're going to do it to a domestic partner, a child, an elder, or another animal, and in also cases, mass shootings. Genesee Sheriff Chris Swanson says over 40% of school shooters have harmed animals previously. So he says the Protect My Pet ballot initiative, if passed, will hold abusers accountable by putting convicted abusers on a registry, forcing them to give up their right to own a pet, and by getting their animals rehomed. So you think you're rescuing them, but they're now in cages. We're going to close that loophole within 22 days of the first probable cause hearing. They're given to people out here and rehomed. Animal shelters and humane societies applauded this effort. Protect My Pet says animal abuse has increased four times in Michigan since 2016. We've had dogs that were left in a basement and the people were just throwing down pizza slices for them to eat. Um, we've had dogs with embedded collars. We've had a dog that was caught on fire. So the goal is to put it before lawmakers and hopefully get it on the November 2024 ballot. Until then, Joelle says she'll continue to fight for Bear and all other pets who are voiceless. I think it's part of the healing process, too. So when I found out about this group, I knew I had to do what I could to be part of it. Again, the goal is to get it on the 2024 ballot. For more information on it, you can head to fox17online.com or click on our mobile app. Reporting here in Lansing, Lauren Edwards, Fox 17 News. And speaking of the safety of pets and animals, Janice... How does the turtle cross the road? I'm sure there's some kind of awesome uh, pun here, but I would just say very slowly. I mean, very probably. slowly is right. There is no awesome pun here. Oh, there's no. <laughs> no this is just, uh, we're getting straight to the point. With the okay. help of an alert, aware driver. All right. There we go. There's the punchline. Okay. <laughs> this spring, the John Ball Zoo wants to remind you turtles are waking up from hibernation and moving to wetlands to, to feed and mate. But these habitats that are often, uh, they have roads running right through them. One of the biggest threats to turtles is a car. I mean, they can't really dodge it very quickly. So if you see the reptile trying to cross the road, stop if it's safe and move it in the direction that it was traveling. Here in Michigan, we are home to several rare turtle species, including the eastern box turtle and wood turtle. I'm, I'm gonna have to think of a better punchline for I that was gonna say, at the end of the show. I expected a little bit more, but... <laughs> I don't want to point fingers at the producer, but I didn't write oh, that script. That's, that wasn't yours. <laughs> okay. Well, still ahead, we all know where to find those potholes in our hometown. We sure do. Uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer says the state is working on a long-term fix. When you do it right, you build it to last, and that's what we're doing here. What to expect this season and the bill trying to protect workers on the side of the road. A breezy winds this afternoon, but they're going to get a little stronger here on Wednesday. Going to contribute to the potential for fire weather both Wednesday and Thursday. We'll go into more detail on that and how long this warm up will last in the full seven day forecast. Five teenagers are now in a juvenile detention center after sheriff's deputies say the group led them on a chase in a stolen car. And today we're getting a look at some of the police dash cam video from the pursuit and hearing from the sheriff's office about the disturbing trend of teens making off with stolen vehicles. Our Michael Martin has the story. Now, after this police chase was all said and done, they pulled five teenagers out of the car, the driver only 15 years old. At one point, they're going the wrong way down a main road as deputies pursued and looked for the vehicle. Well, there were a lot of different factors for them to consider. Safety of the public, the deputies involved, and the suspects in the car. 
Monday night, just after 9 p.m. near Kalamazoo Street and 60th, a Kent County Sheriff's deputy on duty spots a Kia sedan that had recently been reported stolen out of Jenison. They activated their lights. Unfortunately, the vehicle didn't pull over. Streets were still busy at that time. Deputies decided not to chase the car then and there. Right before us is a vehicle that was stolen, and it's our responsibility to take action, but do so in a, a manner which is uh, safe. But just four hours later, about 1.15 a.m., another deputy spots the Kia again, just a few miles away near Eastern and 60th. No, the north lane. No, I'm coming traffic right now. Uh, the traffic volume was significantly less. Uh, the, the, the dangers were not present that had originally been there, and therefore the, the, the decision was we're going to continue to pursue. The chase was on. Going to be going off road behind Grand Motel here. Going off road behind Grand Motel, heading back out towards Hotmail. We know that there's a stolen car. We know it's occupied by multiple individuals. And the traffic conditions and the manner in which they were driving allow for the pursuit to, to be continued. They fly down Division Avenue and then behind the Grand Motel. And they ran into a fence. So we're going to be going back out on Division. Got to run into a fence. Back towards Division. Soon, the car comes to a stop here on Regal Avenue. You got lots of sparks coming from the vehicle. Lots of Juveniles and stolen cars, are they're just not a good combination at all. Uh, just many times they haven't even gone through driver's training and yet they're out on the streets. Yep, keep your hands up. Don't look back, look away. Passenger, go ahead and get out. Inside the car, two 17-year-old boys, two 15-year-old boys, and a 16-year-old girl. All of them now in a juvenile detention center. Their cases will be sent to the prosecutor's office for possible charges. Unfortunately, stolen cars are oftentimes crimes of opportunity. According to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, about 11% of all cars stolen every year are taken because their keys are left inside. Kias are right now a, a, a hot target. Um, they are being stolen far more frequently than what had been in years past. In 2022, 415 vehicles were reported stolen out of Kent County. 112 of those were either Kia or Hondas. There have been 109 stolen so far in 2023. 24 of those have been Kias or Hondas. The situation is different every single time. There are common themes, however, that we do try to avoid, such as leaving your vehicle unattended and running, not locking your car. The vehicle recovered Tuesday morning was a Kia. Why so many Kias and Hondas? Well, young people are able to uniquely hotwire these vehicles from the inside, sometimes without a key in the ignition. Finally, in February, both Kia and Hyundai released software patches for vehicle owners that will make them much harder to steal. In the newsroom, Michael Martin, Fox 17 News. Well, it is just near perfect spring weather here in West Michigan. Temperatures have gotten into the 70s in a lot of communities, but starting to come down a little bit. And with wind out of the west, some communities like Muskegon and Grand Rapids right now at 69 degrees have been stuck in the 60s for this afternoon. But off to the south and west, there's some 80s out there from Minneapolis over to La Crosse and the Quad Cities. We're going to continue to see this warm air move in. But one thing to keep in mind is that where that wind direction is coming from off of the lake shore, we're going to get a little bit of uh, warmth blockage from the cool waters of Lake Michigan. And I think it's going to alleviate us from seeing at least record breaking temperatures across the community, but nonetheless still near it. So there's a 69 in Holland and Muskegon, but 73 in South Haven and 74 in Benton Harbor. Still 75 in Three Rivers here. Great night. Sunshine starting to come back out north of Grand Rapids. We're seeing that cloud deck move through the area right now, and things are only going to get clearer as we head into the evening hours. You can see more high clouds in Muskegon, but the sunshine peeking through. 
beautiful conditions on the water as well. Sunsets along the lakeshore both Wednesday, Thursday, and even into Friday night going to be great views. Here's that narrow deck of clouds here. This is what's coming down with a weak, weak cold front well off to our east. So there's rain in New York and even parts of Canada. We're going to miss that here. We won't see any rain chances uh, for the next several days. So there is a low pressure system far off to the north and west. This is the culprit of this southwesterly flow, especially when you wedge it with a high pressure system off to the south. So that continues to move in with the west southwesterly wind. Going to be breezy tomorrow but temperatures are going to be some of the warmest of the week as well. So it's not much to complain about. We'll continue to just dominate with the warmth and the sunshine and dry air as well. So dew points are only going to remain in the 30s while temperatures get into the upper 70s. But by the time we get to Thursday night, we'll see this cold front slowly start to approach before another warm front moves in. So Friday is still going to remain very mild. So we do start tomorrow with fire weather watch. This is from noon until 8 p.m. Wind gusts to 40 miles per hour. And again, with the dew points in the 30s, that means relative humidity anywhere between 25 and 30 percent. Some areas even less, especially north of Grand Rapids. So just something to keep in mind that don't recommend doing any outdoor burning tomorrow. Uh, be very cautious of any cigarettes, especially out on uh, roadways as well, as that's where a lot more heat radiates off of the concrete. But winds uh, going forwards. Here's tonight. Not much going on. We get to about 5, 6 a.m. They'll start to ramp up. And then in the afternoon, which is why we have it from noon to 8, the fire weather watch is when we'll see peak wind gusts up to about 35 to 40 miles per hour. Thursday, still going to be breezy, so we may have another fire watch for Thursday. Thankfully, though, winds won't be as strong. Here's the next three days. These are, these are the good days in the seven-day forecast. Windy and sunny on Wednesday, light wind and sunny on Thursday, and then a few more clouds on Friday, but the warmest day of the week. So we have three days of no precipitation chances and then things change in the second half of the seven day. We have rain and then as temperatures cool, we do unfortunately track the chance of a few flurries as well. So a great end to the work week. Again, temperatures nearing record. 80 degrees is the record in Grand Rapids on Friday. Be interested to see how close we get. Models are still indicating we may see some communities touch the 80 degree mark, but then we track the rain. So here's a look at what we can expect headed into Friday and into Saturday as well. Most of it starts off to our west and then we see scattered showers. Maybe a few rumbles of thunder mixed in with that as well, just because so much warmth in the atmosphere, it's a little unstable and then things will turn into a little bit of snow by the time we get to Monday and Tuesday. I think it's appalling. It's just another example of why we have to continue to fight for rights that we thought were settled 50 years ago. Continuing coverage on abortion here in Michigan. Yesterday, Governor Whitmer commented on the recent Texas ruling that said that Mufepresto and an abortion pill should be banned. That case has gotten complicated, though, because a separate federal court said the drug is safe and should be legal to sell. And while America waits for clarification from the Court of Appeals and potentially the Supreme Court as well, Democrats are trying to protect the sale of the pill. Well, we've got two courts that have very different rulings. And so I do think that there is a lot of confusion, a lot of anxiety. I also think that you, you cannot ignore the will of the people. The people of this country expect these fundamental rights to, to be sacrosanct, to be available to future generations of Americans. Conversely, Right to Life of Michigan has started a petition telling pharmacies to not distribute of a Pristone saying that it not only ends the life of an innocent unborn child, it poses significant health risks to the woman. Notably, the ban on the pill would not ban medication abortions in the U.S. Still ahead, we'll have the latest from Louisville after a mass shooting left at least five people dead. How the shooter got his hands on the gun and what we know about his history with the Old National Bank. I am a person of faith. I was raised in the church. We've raised our kids in the church. Please, if you are a person of faith and you want to give us your thoughts and your prayers, we want them and we need them. But the Kentucky congressman doesn't only want prayers, he wants policy as well. Lawmakers today continuing to speak on the Louisville shooting that has now left five people dead. Right now, police are releasing body cam footage of how they responded to this attack yesterday. Laura Aguirre has the latest. As Louisville police laid out the facts of Monday's deadly bank shooting, he purchased 
the weapon used on April the 4th legally from one of the local dealerships here in Louisville. Officials were clear on the broader public safety threat of gun violence. We know he texted or called at least one person to let them know he was suicidal and contemplating harm. But we don't have the tools on the books to deal with someone who is in imminent danger to themselves or to others. Some leaders who spoke Tuesday had close ties to one of those killed or injured. I knew Tommy well. His wife even worked with my wife for a time at a company here in town. Yesterday, I've lost a very close friend in another workplace shooting. Officer Nicholas Wilt just graduated from the police academy on March 31st. I just swore him in. Officer Wilt remains in critical condition at the University of Louisville Hospital. For 15 years, I've cared for victims of violence and gunshot wounds. And people say I'm tired, but I'll be answered. It's more than tired. I'm weary. When you hear someone screaming, mommy or daddy, it just becomes too hard day in and day out. We need policies in place that will keep this from happening again so that thoughts and prayers do not have to be offered to yet another community ripped apart by the savage violence coming from guns. I'm Laura Aguirre for Fox 17 News. Meantime, the Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg is suing Republican Jim Jordan. This lawsuit claims the congressman tried to intimidate and attack the DA in an attempt to interfere with the investigation into Donald Trump. While Jordan has subpoenaed a former prosecutor of Bragg's, the suit does seek to block that order. Last week, a grand jury handed down a 34-count indictment against Trump for a hush money payment scheme to keep adult film star Stormy Daniels quiet about an alleged affair. Here's what we're working on for Fox 17 News at 530. Still ahead from far and wide, the city of Grand Rapids searched for a new fire chief. But they stayed within the station for their final pick every day and do the best job we can. We'll hear Dr. Brad Brown's vision for the fire department coming up. Plus, why wait? How the city of Kalamazoo is trying to fast track its plan to make more affordable housing. You're watching Fox 17 News. Welcome back. Finding an affordable place to live is not always easy, and for some it's been an ongoing issue for years yeah, now. Uh, but now Kalamazoo County is trying to limit that stress for residents living there. Yasmin Ludi explains. Kalamazoo County officials are calling it a housing crisis. They tell me between not having enough housing to go around and the rise in cost, something needs to be done now. We've heard from so many families, we've seen the data that when you're 7,750 units short, that is a big number. And we know that we have people doubled up, we have people living in cars, we have people in shelters. Earlier this year, the county launched an online application for nonprofits and developers. There, they could apply for funding so they could bring more affordable housing to the area next year. But housing director Mary Balkama tells me the county can't wait. I thought it would be prudent to open it up again so we would receive applications that we could deploy our money this year and start building. The new application is open with more than $2 million in funding up for grabs. Nonprofits and developers can apply now through April 24th. 335,000 will be available for supportive services and 1.7 million for senior affordable housing or affordable multifamily rental housing. So the two million is coming from our housing millage that was approved by the voters in November of 2020 and is levied on the um, December bill and it generates approximately seven and a half million dollars this year. Balkama says in addition to the new application, the Public Housing Commission is also opening an application for families experiencing homelessness. Kalamazoo County Public Housing Commission has $200,000 av available to remove barriers to housing for families with school aged children in the county. So that is opened as well. And I think that is this county board's goal, to have it safe, decent, affordable, to grow the tax base, and really grow the lives of our citizens. 
The hope is that with nonprofits and developers taking advantage of this opportunity, people that are struggling can find a place to call home. Reporting in Kalamazoo, Yasmin Ludi, Fox 17 News. Well, sunsets are going to be mostly good to go. Any high clouds in the area are really just going to enhance some of the vibrancies uh, of the sunsets in the area. This is South Haven. You see a few seagulls out there as well. And a couple people, it uh, looks like they're taking some selfies out in the pier as well. Beautiful evening for that. Any picnics outdoors or uh, tracking along the pier. Unfortunately, tomorrow with strong winds, some of that sand might be blowing in your face. So recommended maybe tomorrow just to walk uh, in the cities instead of going right to the beach. But this evening, again, great. Winds can continuing to quiet down and temperatures remain in the 60s with partly to mostly sunny skies. We'll see the cloud deck along the lakeshore continue to dissipate quicker than areas inland. By the time we get to midnight, we should turn to just a few thin high clouds and then mostly sunny by the time we wake up on Wednesday morning. This is high temperatures for tomorrow. We are looking at the potential for 80 degrees down near I-94, but look at the difference along the lakeshore. Five to 10 degrees cooler, especially Muskegon up towards Spring Lake and then areas uh, near uh, Oceana County and up towards Pentwater as well. But 74 in Grand Rapids, 79 in Hastings. And then Thursday and Friday, we keep an eye on the potential for some records. Average high right now, 56 degrees. Grand Rapids, Muskegon forecasted lower 60s to upper 70s across the area. And you can see records, we're looking at a couple of degrees off, but nonetheless, really, really mild air settling in. And I won't be surprised if at least one community uh, is to break above a record. You'd see Kalamazoo just four degrees off the forecast there for Friday. Grand Rapids only three degrees off on the forecast. But unfortunately, it doesn't last long by the time we get to Saturday. Looks like we may even see a few thunderstorms before the cool air really filters in with more rain and a few flurries. The Grand Rapids Fire Department is doing great things, and we're really excited just to keep that going. Of actual crime and if all goes well for incoming Fire Chief Dr. Brad Brown, he hopes the city won't even notice the difference. Today, Dr. Brown was welcomed by GR leaders into a new leadership position of his own. A 20-year veteran with the fire department will become the city's 25th fire chief. Last year, when Chief John Lehman announced he was retiring, a nationwide search began for his replacement. But GRFD ultimately opted to stay in-house, promoting their deputy chief of services to the role. While Dr. Brown served as acting chief in the past, he says he's humble now to accept this position full-time. It's something that uh, when you start out right in the back of the fire truck 20, 30 years ago, you, you never think you're going to get to that level and may not even want to. And my career just laid out a little differently. I spent a lot of time in administration. And as I got closer to it, I just realized that might be something I want to go for. And uh, when I got the call, I was very happy. As the city's 25th fire chief, Dr. Brown hopes to build stations on division in Kalamazoo and begin a new training facility to keep up with the city's growth. In the city of Wyoming, there's a new hunt for a new city manager. There are four candidates vying for that position. Residents will have the chance to meet them in the coming days. But we're going to show them, you, show them to you right now. From left to right, we have Jen DeHaan, the current assistant township manager and superintendent of Plainfield Charter Township. John McCarter, Wyoming's interim city manager, Mark Myers, the city administrator of Norton Shores, and on the far right there is John Shea, who most recently served as the Ottawa County administrator. Wyoming City Council has scheduled two candidate interviews. They are open to the public. We have that information on your screen right now, so if you would like to read up on the candidates ahead of time, you can do that on the city's website. And the council hopes to have their new city manager in place by the end of May. Still ahead, eight in 10 nurses in Michigan say they're burnt out. And more than one in four say they plan to take vacation more of it soon. And you can't really blame them. The survey that revealed cracks in the health care and how many nurses plan on leaving the profession in the next year. The national emergency for COVID-19 officially coming to an end more than three years after it was first announced. The GOP-led resolution passed the House last month despite Democratic opposition. While the White House said it opposed the measure, President Biden did give it his signature. The resolution will end several waivers for federal health programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Meantime, the public health emergency, along with the Trump-era border policy, both still set to expire next month.